one that I care deeply about. <clears throat> you talk about being a person of hope and not despair. So here we are. Wow, we went through all of these uh, virtues and those vices <clears throat> that grip us, right? That's our default. And if we're going to really remove these vices from our lives, especially going into the next week with the gods at war, you'll really start seeing that application, that life application to fight those uh, those gods. We, we all have things uh, that are forms in our flesh, things that uh, we, we go to uh, is almost like a binky, right? Adult versions of binkies uh, to kind of uh, make us feel good to get through the things we really do need to struggle with. Uh, we all have it, every one of us. And that's the, the struggle until we're on the other side uh, with the Lord himself in heaven. So again, last week we focused on being a person of charity and not indifference. And that's where we unpacked the, the unique Christianity, uh, the, the word agape love, right? Uh, that your Bible just simply translates as love. And a lot of the word for word translations will translate it as charity, trying to capture that agape love. But agape love is one way, unconditional, sacrificial form of love where you are the sacrifice. And there's a reason why charity is known as that binding virtue. So um, today we're going to talk about hope. And hope is known as the motivating virtue. So now it's very important when a Christian uses the word hope, he or she does not mean blind optimism or wishful thinking. I know I'm an hour from Disney. It's not that kind of hope, right? It's a real hope. That modern idea of hope, unfortunately, uh, it has kind of become as meaningless as, as I believe, as in if it's a blind chance and serendipity or good luck. Uh-uh. Uh, that is not what we mean uh, for the biblical version of hope. <clears throat> I like the definition my former pastor, Lon Solomon at McLean Bible used to say, he said, Christian Christianity has a no so hope, not a hope so hope. And wow, what a difference that is. So let's talk about the virtue and the vice, right? So the vice is despair, right? And the virtue is hope. Well, the Greek word for hope in the Bible is elpis. And it means this quote, a confidence, a confidence while waiting with the expectation of obtaining that which is desired. And as you see here in the challenge coin I, I created for hope, you'll see this anchor. <clears throat> and uh, the anchor has been the symbol of hope. Uh, it's one of the earliest forms uh, you'll find in the catacombs uh, for Christianity, right? This hope. And it's the anchor is, is such a neat uh, symbol and it's rooted in Hebrews 6, 19. That means, quote, this hope we have is an anchor for the soul, a hope both sure in steadfast that's that's powerful right so if you think about what an anchor does right an anchor <clears throat> it's suitable to receive and hold our burdens right it has this bend so when a storm of uh despair breaks right what do you do you, you drop anchor right and why, why you drop an anchor right because you want to be held steadfast right that's the key and you the anchor needs a rock to hold on to what a beautiful symbol of jesus christ who is our rock so in the storms of life, we need real hope. We don't need some blind serendipity, right? We need real no-so hope, not hope-so hope. So again, that symbol is an anchor. And uh, the Greek word literally means an arm, especially bent to receive a burden. Now that is powerful. In short, despair is the disease, my friends, but it's hope that is the cure. So when the storms of life come and we need hope, to anchor us, to help us remain steadfast so that we do not despair. So here's some of the properties of hope or the sub-virtues of hope. So when you're thinking of hope, these, these words of freedom, right? Assurance, trust, right? Contentment, wow, that's a big one, right? Peace, confidence, perseverance, and long suffering. Then what's the properties of despair? Well, friends, if you are in despair, for way too long, you are definitely going to have a cynical spirit. It leads to cynicism, unbelief, helplessness, right? Hopelessness and a deep doubt. It's okay to have, have, have doubts. It's what you do with those doubts, right? We're, 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 what do you do with those things? But when you have this deep doubt that kind of puts you in this state of despair, that is really where hope comes in. So I'm going to unpack two particular properties of hope, uh, which I highlighted here in red, perseverance and long suffering, because they are linked. Now, here's what's interesting. You might remember this from the fortitude week. 
the property or sub virtue of perseverance is a shared property between fortitude and hope. So think about that, right? So what is the vice of fortitude? Fear, right? The vice of hope, despair. So it takes fortitude. It takes courage to face your fears. It takes courage to, to have this hope that you're going to get through whatever it is that's pulling you down. So I find that fascinating. That it takes courage, right, to persevere when suffering. Well, two particular forms of suffering uh, grip us, right? And it could be anxiety and depression. They will put bring both fear. Usually, it's a un, uh, it's a unrealistic fear. It's a it's a it's a false fear, right? And the vice of fortitude uh, is what you need to kind of link with hope, so that you don't despair. So I'm going to address these two very important topics today anxiety and depression so but first i'm going to start off the morning with some stats that are not uh not that glorious it's to show you the impact of despair but i think it's really important so i'm going to show you some statistics on the reality of suicide and um i seem to get hit with it uh quite a bit here um so let me show you suicide rates especially among men suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the u.s in 2019, 47,511 Americans died by suicide, but there's 1.38 million suicide attempts. So let's dive into the data a little bit more, right? The rate of suicide is highest, what, among middle-aged white men. In 2019, men died by suicide, look at that, almost four times more often than women, White males accounted for, oh, look at that, 69.38% of suicide deaths were among white males. But as you look at those, and you're like, oh, my word, those stats. I don't want you to miss the hope that's highlighted here. 93% of adults surveyed in the U.S. in the same study believe that suicide can be prevented. And that number has remained steady as, over the years. And I think they are right. So, but what happens is identity thieves come, and this is what leads us into despair. And the, the Bible has something to say about identity thieves. Jesus said this, a thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. But what stops us from having this abundant life? Well, there's identity thieves that lead us to this place of despair. <clears throat> so who are we talking about, right? <clears throat> Well, there's enemies on the outside of us, right? So if you look at this avatar here from the Wii game my kids had made for me one time, I mean, I appreciate all the brown hair. I think we're going to have to change that to the gray dome of wisdom, as the book of Proverbs calls it. Um, so there's some hope there for me. Well, what's the enemy outside? Well, people put labels on you, right? <clears throat> people put tons of labels on you. They say you're nothing but a. And that, or that you might have that from your past, and that's a recording. It's it's a it's a bad tape for us Gen Xers, right? Or for you know the millennials, it's a little, it's MP3, okay, right? But it's playing over and over in your mind these lies over and over. Then you camp on those, and you grab those every time you camp on those lies, and you put an emotion, even a negative emotion, to it. You create that synapse connection. It creates a deep connection in the brain. Don't miss that. Uh, or you will have blank disorder. So there's all hope. Well. There you go. I have what, what do I do now, right? I have this disorder, or you're a mistake. Um, you're a blankaholic, right? Think about the list that went through that video that uh, Phil just showed. Or you'll never be. Wow, there's there's one, right? Talk about robbing someone of hope. You play these lies over and over in our minds. Or as we've seen in week one, right? The personal cyberbullying. We'll look at blah blah blah. Our young don't have any chance of getting away from cyberbullying it's with you 24 7 you can't even hide from the bully uh anymore but look this may hurt uh on the outside it can it can it can impact us for sure but it, the impact really happens is when you internalize it you know i'm in a cybersecurity field and i can tell you right now that the biggest threat is the insider threat we just saw that there's this big leak right uh so that insider threat that enemy on the inside is the worst. And I think that's true with our own lives. This truth applies to us. And I have these picture of ants here because what gets us an inside are ants. And well, what are ants? Well, I'll show you what ants are. <clears throat> so you place labels on yourself. You start believing them. 
you start internalizing that message and it becomes a recording you play over and over. You start saying, I, someone said you will never, you start saying, well, I will never be. You start believing it. Well, you're putting your faith in the wrong thing. You're giving people too much power. So you have to kill those ants. Ants are automatic negative thoughts. And it means you have those same audio files playing over and over and over again. And this will lead you to be a man or woman of despair every time. Well, today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to approach this lesson a little bit differently than I did the other ones. I'm going to reverse my teaching today. And I'm going to tell you what to do if you want to really embrace that vice in your life. Hey, if you want to be a man or woman of despair and not hope, I'm going to give you some things that you can do to become a man or woman of despair. And it will definitely work. Don't be defined by your mistakes and struggles. Well, how do you want to be a person of despair? Well, do these things. Endure suffering all alone. Endure your struggles all by yourself, without God and without his people. Don't take the time to connect to others. Just do it all by myself. So I got it. Just me and my Bible. We'll take care of it. Well, that doesn't work out that well. Um, the world was shocked by a suicide of funny man, Robin Williams. I remember, I don't know this. I don't know this guy, but I remember when he, when he uh, took his life, I, I got a little emotional. I'm like, well, that's just so weird, right? Well, why were people so shocked? I mean, you listen to the things people said and people were on stage crying and it was, it was unbelievable. Well, why? Well, cause he was funny. Right. And we believe that making people smile or laugh as a reflection of one's own happiness, and then you just have the benefit of catching it. Well, as someone who used humor his whole life uh, to cover pain, I can sympathize with this great comedian. Uh, yeah, uh, people get me for my wit, my wittiness, uh, but that wittiness uh, came from a place of hurt, uh, right? But the sad thing about Robin Williams is that he went to the wrong place for hope. So this cycle of despair, humor, alcohol, drugs, they all medicated, but never eradicated the despair in his heart. And friends, listen, do not miss this. Anxiety and depression are two forms of despair in this life that even the Christian is not immune from. I say it again, even the Christian is not immune from it. And we have so many biblical examples, and we have so many examples of the great ones in the past. Charles Spurgeon was gripped with anxiety and depression, and he made a huge impact for the Lord. But let's take a look at Psalmist David and see how uh, he struggled. I want you to pay attention. I have certain things highlighted we're going to talk about. Let me read through Psalm 42, verses 4 through 6. My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you in despair on my soul? And why have you become so disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. Oh my God, my soul is in despair <clears throat> with, within me. Man, wow. Notice what David did. I used to go along with the throng. He isolated himself, but he sees himself. He'll go again. He'll head out again. So he saw his hope was coming back in God. He's, there's hope coming at the end of this uh, psalm, but you start seeing at the beginning that he's isolating himself. Not a good idea. I have a very close friend, very strong believer, who was gripped in the pit of anxiety attacks. He would have this happen to him in his lives in these kind of seasons. And he called me and he said, hey, P, I really need you to pray for me. Man. I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble sleeping for the past few weeks. And it's anxiety and panic attacks just kind of overcome me. And he said, I need you to pray for me. And I just I just felt this uh, in my spirit. I, I called his wife, said, hey, just so you know, I'm coming over. And I'm going to stay. So I popped over, showed up at his house, and I, I stayed the night. Uh, I slept on the floor uh, upstairs. When he'd wake up, we sat down, we'd talk, we'd pray, we'd uh, just connect over what was going on. I wanted my friend to know that he's not alone. He didn't feel like 
uh, reached out. I mean, he'd been dealing with this for a few weeks, and then he finally reaches out for prayer, right? And then he's like, well, you know, just pray for me. I'm like, mm, you need more than prayer. You need to know that you are not alone and that you're less than for having this experience of panic attacks. I'll tell you right now, and he will tell you that from that day on, it was a huge pivot, a huge pivot. Uh, to, to where it was an anchor almost like changing his trajectory. And he hasn't had these panic attacks since, and it's been a while now. Well, it's really important to have this, uh, this connection with others. And you need it face-to-face -face as well. A new study popped out uh, that said this, quote, low levels of face-to-face -face social contact can double the depression risk. Researchers find that people who meet friends and family at least three times a week were far less likely to have depression than those who only have virtual contact. Lead author Alan Teo from the Oregon Health and Science University Psychiatrist says this, quote, quote, we found that not all forms of socialization are equal. Phone calls, digital communication with friends and family members don't have the same power as face-to-face -face social interactions in helping to stave off depression. At least in that, when you get the Zoom connection, you at least see the faces of others. But man, we're made for human touch. So don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. If you want to uh, stay in despair, do it alone. There's a great quote uh, by C.S. Lewis regarding friendship that I love. It says this, quote, friendship is born at the moment when one person says to another, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. Well, this is the case. When I met Dennis, my non-Christian friend, I just loved him as a brother, um, loved him to death. Uh, well, five years ago, my friend Dennis committed suicide. His world came crashing down when, as a final straw, his wife had filed for divorce. But what Dennis did was he self-isolated. I reached out to him constantly, several times a day, several days a week, then several more times, phone calls, hit, trying to catch him at different ends. Call me, don't isolate, you know, calling him out on it. Isolate, isolate, isolate. Last, I saw him, he dropped a 70 uh, pounds, right? And... His wife contacted me after um, uh, after his uh, fu funeral and said, hey, I just want to thank you for reaching out uh, to Dennis all those times. She knew I did. She had, she had heard from him that I did, but he would not connect with me. And what did he solve? He solved nothing. You know, I feel sorry for him. I, I, my heart broke for him, but I'll be honest. And this is an honest feeling and it's, it's accurate. I was ticked off at him for the selfishness. Seven kids, right? Unnecessarily having this permanent solution to a temporary problem. He didn't have an anchor in his life. And he isolated from, from someone who really cared and wanted to uh, connect with him on it. He went right back into how he did things as, as, in his childhood, right? Handling everything by himself. I had a friend of mine uh, commit suicide, childhood friend I, I, I grew up with, I've known forever, just uh, shoot six, seven weeks ago. My wife pops in the house with her friend and you know I'm, I'm there, you know, bawling. It's like, what's going on? I'm like, okay, first of all, I have to let my wife know it's not the kids, <laughs> right? And uh, it just caught me off guard, shocked me, shocked me that this happened. Again, uh, sad to see. <clears throat> well, he isolated himself, rejected uh, connection, and that's where it led him. And friends, this leads me to a question for when you need help, right? Well, what does help look like outside of just uh, connecting to a, a friend or you know, what does that look like, right? You need a friend who cares. Well, depending on your view of man, if it's a biblical view or if it's the non-biblical view, will depend on what you think help looks like. If you remember this slide from, from the early on in the first week, we talked about this. There's this unbiblical view of the body. This is the, called materialism. It's not the type of materialism where you shop at Tyson's 2 and not Tyson's 1. That's a different kind of materialism, but that's, you'll talk about that at God's at War. This is the type of materialism where you only believe your material being, right? So, hey, the, the mind really is just what they call epiphenomenal. It's just, it's just an outpouring in the brain. Everything's, they're just all interconnected somehow. So um, your personality, there's no free will, all, all your emotions, your, your brain uh, connection is your, is your destiny. Well, friends, that is a, a, a materialist view, and that is a secular view, and that is an unbiblical view. The biblical view that in, in philosophy of mind is called dualism is that, no, the body has, in the brain, have physical traits, and the, and the soul has your mind, your personality, your emotions, your free will and conscious. And friends, there's this interaction between both, right? What you do in your body, right? Not taking care of your body or 
or having some disturbances of some disruptions, right, will impact your soul. And friends, it, this is the other way around too. Constant free will, making constant bad choices, right? Your conscious things that are eating you up, right? Like those lies playing in your mind will impact your body, right? There's this interactionist approach to both of them. And what most people don't realize is the fact that we wouldn't even have neuroscience without dualists. The foundation of neuroscience happened with dualists, people who hold this biblical view. Not all of them were Christians, but they had this biblical view because that's where the evidence is. I'll give you some examples. Charles Sherrington, he's considered the father of uh, neuroscience itself. He was a dualist. Neurosurgeon Wilder Pinfield, who's considered the father of modern epilepsy surgery. He's a dualist. Sir John Achilles, a dualist. He's a Nobel laureate in medicine for his groundbreaking work on the functioning of neurosynapses. Neuroscientist Jeffrey Swartz, who documented evidence that mental states, right, mental, these are metaphysical mental states, i.e. the mind shows measurable changes in brain function. The bottom line, friends, is that our material brain is read-write and not read-only. And now all of a sudden, what are they talking about, right? They went to, down this whole materialist route, and now they're talking about neuroplasticity. Welcome to the Bible. The Bible always holds out if you hold on to that as your truth. Bottom line, again, is that that's a big deal, right? If it's read right, that means there's hope. There's changes we can do to impact the way we think and the way we feel. Hey, philosophically today, as Madonna would say, right, we're in a material world and our modern approach to mental health commits what's called uh, the reductive fallacy in logic. So what's the reductive fallacy? The reductive fallacy is when you do something complex like your emotions to just one aspect of it, saying it's just a chemical. For example, do I love my wife just because I have a chemical response? Or did my love for my wife cause the chemical response that causes the feeling, the experience of the affections that I have? That real, was really a big deal about last week with being a person of charity and not difference, friends. When you're not indifferent, you're showing agape, self-sacrificial love towards someone. What ends up happening is your storge, your affections grow with intensity. And that is a good thing. We know this intuitively, and we have to have it educated out of us. We know that human behavior makes the most sense when you explain it in terms of meaning and purpose, desires, beliefs, and choices, not chemicals and molecules, volts, wires, and motion. That's how I talk about my laptop. That's not how I talk about my mind. So let me illustrate to you the impact of believing there are simply material beings and the mind is nothing but a physical brain. And, and this is the big slide for you. <clears throat> so really pay attention. This is some good stuff here. So on this slide, I have a couple of resources I'm going to recommend to you, uh, which take a holistic, whole person approach to dealing with anxiety and depression. Instead of this minimalist approach that assumes materialism. As many of you know, whether it's personally, right, or through, through friends and family, anxiety and depression are real problems. And as such, real problems need real solutions. And as that previous slide made clear, well, what you determine a real solution option is, well, depends upon the worldview that you assume and that you bring to the problem. And I could promise you in our post-Christian material world of quick fix solutions, it's mistaken, right? We're, we're addressing the effect and not the cause. Well, why? Because most, quote, experts today were trained in our seminaries of secularism, I call them. Our modern university has become seminaries of secularism is simply a materialist underpinning. I love this visual by um, Bob Phillips in his wonderful book. Uh, but I have one minor but extremely important edit that you'll see here in a moment. And I want you to not miss it. So if you embrace the philosophy of the day, materialism, and you limit your solution to material one only, i.e. you end up with this medication only approach. It's rooted in the medical model. And this approach leads to despair and label making, identity thieves you embrace. Because <clears throat> where's the hope, right? Oh, it's just, you're, you're, it's destiny here. So it looks like this, right? Mental illness or disease, right? Then, well, the cause must be this, this chemical imbalance. There's the reductive fallacy, right? And then, well, the result is there's this disruption in physical symptoms, you know, ticks or other things, right? You, we know that. That happens, right? There's acting out behaviors. Well, course of action, we'll seek outside of blames for the emotions or behavior. Just, just prescribe a drug to deal with it. 
and the individual tends to become you know, a victim of this, right? And all, all of a sudden remains that the care is only in the punted to the care of the doctor alone, right? And, and what's the result of that? You're going to constantly change your medication, right? Because it's like wacko weasel because something else is going on underneath the hood. So let me show you the uh, other model, right? So this is the holistic approach. There are two extremes that people take, and I don't want you to miss this. Please hear me. Do not miss this. One extreme is the medication only extreme that you see here on, on, on the left-hand side, which denies the existence of the soul. We're back to the other slide, right? The other extreme is the no medication at all approach, which denies the false impact on the body. Ah, right? And this is my quick edit to Bob Phillips' wonderful charts here. The counseling model says you have a mental disorder or there's some maladaption going on. Well, what's the cause? Build up of stress from many sources. I went through what I consider a mild form of depression, I don't know, seven, I don't know, ten, well, probably about 10 years ago now. And I met with the same friend that I helped out and literally just me going blah, getting it out of my system and having a good conversation, him giving me context, man, set me on the right trajectory. Man, I was not myself. I was snapping. I was snippy. I was, I was just, well, I, I had lost my, my direction, right? And it happens to the best of us. Well, what's the course of action then? If you have this disruption, the same physical uh, symptoms or acting out behaviors like I had, right? Well, you tend to take ownership for it. Now, wait a minute. If I take ownership, that means I take control. That means if I'm taking control and I'm saying you ultimately are in control, Lord, I can start having some hope because that's that that's what that end result is, right? Is that I have partners in what's going on with my life. I don't punt to someone else for what's going on in my life. Now, let me give you an example. So what if, this is why that only is a critical edit. So what if you address your heart condition with either just medication alone? Hey, you just kept on tearing up the dozen of eggs every morning, eating donuts, Krispy Kremes, and you're saying, hey, but I'm just taking this pill. It's going to work for me. Well, you're just thinking, well, Pete, that's nuts. Why do we do the same thing? Why do we do this with mental health, right? Why, or just diet alone. You know what? I'm going to rub essential oils just on me, and I'll take care of it, right? Or, or I'm just going to just take some vitamins or just my diet alone. Well, that will help or it may not help, Right. Why do we settle for this minimalist approach when it comes to mental health and not take a whole person approach, the biblical model that recognizes the whole man and the whole woman made in God's image, but fallen, living in a fallen world and the fall impacted the body as well as the soul, right? That's the, that's the impact, right? You do both. And sometimes like my friend, right? I went over, spent time with him, but he had a little bit of uh, anxiety medication while he was doing some counseling to figure out what was going on, was able to link it to help him through that season temporarily. It wasn't forever. It wasn't destiny. Very, very few folks have that kind of that category, right? It wasn't destiny forever. And friends, some of these things can send you over the edge, right? If you read some of these things, I, I have a very close friend, family member who's struggling with anxiety and panic attacks, took talked to the counselor once, all of a sudden labeled him, took the certain medication and was waking up with socks and killed himself. It was like overwhelming. Thank goodness his wife, you know, was there and grabbed him. Almost put him over the edge, friends. And I wonder how many of these uh, has happened. You take a holistic approach. That is the biblical model. Don't deny the body's impact and say, well, I'll never take a pill ever. And don't punt at all. That's all I'll do. And that's all I am. There's, there's a balance here and find that balance because Ecclesiastes 718 puts it this way. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes, avoid all extremes and take a whole person approach. And then you'll have hope. I love what C.S. Lewis says about anxiety, especially himself who struggled with some anxiety. Some people feel guilty about their anxieties and regard them as a defect in the faith. I don't agree at all. They are afflictions, not sins. And like all afflictions they are, if we can so take them, our share in the passion of Christ. I love that quote. There's hope in there, right? Don't label this going, oh my gosh, 
I'm a bad Christian because I, I, I feel this way. Don't be so foolish. Don't do that label to yourself, right? It's part of the fall. And this leads me to the importance property of perseverance and why perseverance matters and long suffering. Romans 5, 3 through 5 says this. We also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Who exalts in their tribulations? We're supposed to just hurry up and give it. No, no. These things are building up. They're kind of tempering us, right? <clears throat> building up perseverance, right? Then what does perseverance do? Well, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint. Romans 8, 24 and 25. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. But if we hope what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. From these two verses, you see that perseverance is a key property of hope when experiencing suffering, such as anxiety and depression, or just going through a, a bad season, right? We have those as well. It all depends, right? Perseverance implies patience. Oh, I'm a type A. I don't know about you all, man, but a patience is, is, is a tough one for me, right? But it's a very specific type of patience called long suffering. You're eagerly waiting. You have this no-so hope. The suffering doesn't go away, but you're being patient in that suffering. And sometimes what kicks off, it kicks off this deep despair when we experience loss, right? And there's a second way, right? You have the first way if you want to be a person of despair, isolate yourself. And here's a second way if you want to be a person of despair. Well, have a loss of an eternal perspective. This, <clears throat> this tombstone captures hope like no other. Art is powerful. That's why I find abstract art that's rooted in relativism silliness, right? It's ugly. The uglier society gets, the uglier art gets. This art points beyond itself. It's a symbol that points beyond itself to the substance this truth, right? This truth that there is hope. Matthew was this 11-year-old boy and he died. He was blind and paralyzed from the neck down from the time of his birth. 11 years he lived in this condition. His parents took great care of him and his dad designed this powerful tombstone expressing hope. Imagine going through the graveyard and seeing this. Wow, what images of hope that must bring to folks who experience fresh loss or folks who have experienced loss they still haven't got over and they see this hope. Friends, that's what First Thessalonians is all about. Quote, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as those who have no hope. No way, but does it say don't grieve at all? No, no, there's a time for grieving. Look, I appreciate that we label uh, things celebration of life now, like celebrating lives and being, being positive. But friends, there's a time for grieving and it is okay. The book of Ecclesiastes gives you there's a time for all kinds of things and grieving is one of them. Jesus himself, right? Jesus wept uh, when, even when he knew what was going to do happen with Lazarus. But we don't grieve like those who have no hope. It's a different type of grieving. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Imagine these parents seeing their son coming with the Lord Jesus. Powerful image here. <clears throat> C.S. Lewis captured our reality when he said this, quote, it is since the Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. And <clears throat> let's not do this, friends. So if you want to be a person of hope and not despair, we'll do those things. Um, but if you want to be a person of hope and not despair, and I, I think we do, right? I think we want to be a person of hope. What I say, not a hope, not, not a hope so hope or a happenstance or we'll just maybe it might happen. Uh, 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 uh. A no so hope because we have a no so God who knows all things and knows us in particular. <clears throat> Find an anchor. Find an anchor, Galatians 6, 2, I love this. Bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ, right? Wow, if you want to be a person of hope and not despair, well, find an anchor. You need to persevere through suffering and it can never happen in isolation. And then second, never lose your eternal perspective. Remember, we have a no-so hope and not a hope-so hope. Uh, and that is really critical. So I have a good friend of mine uh, who 
when he's he's ahead of me in seasons of life so i would always chat with him so his name's kelly matthews i say hey kelly so he's really close he had uh four daughters one son he's really close his oldest son his oldest son went off to college and i said hey you know uh my son joe at the time was in ninth grade i said hey you know you know as you're in this season of life you know is there anything you regret or any fruit i could pick from lessons you learned or anything that went well and and him and his son had such a great relationship. They did in ministry together. They both loved music and they served in youth together. They did all kinds of things. He said, I got to tell you, Pete, the one thing that I regret is Kelly was like, like one of my best friends. He's my son. And I didn't build relationships with other men. I said, well, shoot, I'm not going to do that. So I started a small group with, with some solid believers that we can have those shoulder to shoulder relationships. I had lots of mentoring relationships. But I need those shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder relationships to keep us strong. And uh, and we stayed together as a group for a long time until I moved here to Florida. And we just started a small group 